In 1983, DC Comics acquired a line of characters from Charlton Comics that they were free to do whatever they wanted. Around the same time, Alan Moore wanted to write a story that put a very different spin on the concept of the superhero. Upon learning that DC had recently acquired the line of characters, which included The Peacemaker, The Question, Blue Beetle, Peter Cannon, Thunderbolt, Nightshade, and Captain Atom, he devised a murder mystery plot which would incorporate some of these characters. Moore thought that an interesting way to start a comic would be to have a famous superhero found dead. And as the mystery would unravel, the reader would be led deeper and deeper into the real heart of the superhero world, exploring many elements that had up until then not been explored. He explored the premise and crafted a proposal he titled, Who Killed the Peacemaker, which he submitted unsolicited to DC managing editor Dick Giordano. Giordano was positive to the proposal, but not so much to the idea of using the characters DC had recently acquired. DC had paid good money for the characters and they didn't want them to end up dead or useless to them so quickly after having acquired them. Instead, Giordano persuaded Moore to continue with the idea, but make up new characters. Moore, however, was hesitant. He wasn't sure that original characters would provide the necessary emotional resonance for the readers. Ultimately, however, he decided to experiment with the idea instead of dismissing it altogether. And eventually, as he continued to work on the story, he realized that if he wrote substitute characters that were well-defined enough to seem familiar in one way or another, and that if he could give them attributes that the comic book readers recognized and felt familiar with, it could work. Enter Dave Gibbons, who would become the illustrator and main collaborator with Moore, and who had collaborated with Moore on previous projects. He heard through the grapevine that Moore was working on a treatment for a new miniseries. Always interested in working with Moore again, Gibbons called him up and told him that he wanted to be involved in whatever he was working on. Moore then soon sent him the story outline, which prompted Gibbons to reach out to DC managing editor Giordano and tell him that he wanted to draw the series. Moore approved and they began working together once again, and this time they would go on to create what is considered to be one of the most important graphic novels of all time. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, the punctilious, and the dark side of superheroes. I am your host, Jason Nemoore Hardin, and today we're exploring one of the quintessential graphic novels ever, Alan Moore's Watchmen. My experience of life is that it is not divided up into genres. It's a horrifying, romantic, tragic, comical, science fiction, cowboy detective novel. You know, with a bit of pornography, if you're lucky. End quote. After receiving the go-ahead, Moore and Gibbons spent a day at Moore's house creating characters, crafting details for the story's milieu, and discussing influences. The pair was particularly influenced by a Mad Magazine parody of Superman called Super Duper Man. But instead of going the comedic route, they would dive deeper into the dramatic elements. Moore would later state that his intention was to create something that had the sort of weight and density to it as Moby Dick. It would be sort of Moby Dick of superheroes. Thus, Moore and Gibbons designed Watchmen to showcase the unique qualities of the medium of comics, highlighting its particular strengths. It would also challenge its reader, as Moore intended Watchmen to be read four or five times, as some links and allusions would only become apparent to the reader after repeated readings. Dave Gibbons would later explain that as the Watchmen progressed, it became much more about the telling than the tale itself. The main thrust of the story essentially hinges on what is called a MacGuffin, a gimmick, meaning that the plot itself is of no great consequence, as it's not the most interesting thing about Watchmen. When the two artists came to tell the tale, that's where the real creativity came in. The story came quite easy, according to Moore 
and the subsequent impact of the comic would also be quite easy to attain as no other creators before them had challenged the assumptions in the superhero genre. The main element of this was, wouldn't superheroes be a joke if they actually existed? Wouldn't they be kind of sad and pitied as well as touching in the real world? Well, Moore saw no reason why they shouldn't explore those elements and went deep into the reality of the superhero life in the real world. They would, like normal human beings, be flawed and affected by their egos. In addition to this, they would also often be weighted down by the self-proclaimed responsibility of accepting their superhero roles. In essence, they used the superhero characters as more human than super and used them to reflect different types of human beings instead of different kinds of super beings. No one had taken the superhero concept and applied the norms of society up until then. Questions such as, how would politics influence their existence, and how would they deal with sexuality, quickly arose. Growing out of the political landscape of the 1980s with the Cold War at its hottest and most urgent moment, true destruction seemed like a real possibility, which led to incorporating the global scenario of the political and capitalistic system unfolding in the background of the story. Utilizing the superhero format, they were free to discuss the notions of power and responsibility in an increasingly complex world. Our world. What Watchmen became was a total meditation in power. Spider-Man said that with great power comes great responsibility. But what happens to the element of responsibility when you are dealing with the real humans behind the superhumans, who aren't always good or bad, but who are flawed and who are just like we all are? Quote, there are two worlds we live in, a material world bound by the laws of physics and the world inside our mind, which is just as important. End quote. Moore came up with the character names and descriptions, but left the specifics of how they looked to Dave Gibbons. Gibbons would spend several weeks just doing sketches, not sitting down and designing the characters deliberately, but rather letting them unfold organically based on the descriptions provided by Moore. Gibbons coming to understand that this would be a big project also made sure to create the characters so they were easy to draw. Rorschach was his favorite on account of it being the easiest to draw, saying, you just have to draw a hat. If you can draw a hat, then you've drawn Rorschach. You just draw a kind of a shape for his face and put some black blobs on it, and you're done. Gibbons also said he deliberately constructed the visual look of Watchmen so that each page would be identifiable as part of that particular series and stand out from all other comic books of the time. Because of this, he made a conscious effort to draw the characters in a manner different from that commonly seen in comics. Gibbons tried to draw the series with, as he said, a particular weight of line, using a hard, stiff pen that didn't have much modulation in terms of thick and thin, which he hoped would differentiate it from the usual lush, fluid kind of comic book line. Moore also took advantage of Gibbons' particular talent for including incredible amounts of detail into every tiny panel, and because of this, they could choreograph every little thing. The story's alternate world setting allowed Gibbons to change details of the American landscape, such as adding electric cars, slightly different buildings, and spark hydrants instead of fire hydrants, which Moore commented, perhaps gives the American readership a chance in some ways to see their own culture as an outsider would. Gibbons then brought on colorist John Higgins on account of his unusual style. Another plus was that Higgins lived near Gibbons, which allowed the two to discuss the art and the direction they wanted to go on a face-to-face -face level, rather than having to send art back and forth across the ocean. Opposed to the classic superhero comics, where the heroes were classic bright primary colors like red and blue, John Higgins used a template that was moodier and favored secondary colors. This made Watchmen explore a different palette of oranges and greens, more subdued, making it feel like the opposite of the classic and also giving it its very own feel and touch. Moore stated that though he'd always loved Higgins' coloring, the artist had always been associated with being an airbrush colorist, 
which Moore was not fond of. Thus, it was therefore an even more positive surprise when Higgins subsequently decided to color Watchmen in European-style flat color. Moore noted that Higgins paid particular attention to lighting and subtle color changes. An example of this was in issue 6, where Higgins began with warm and cheerful colors and throughout the issue gradually made it darker to give the story a dark and bleak feeling. Then came Lynn Wein, who soon joined the project as its editor, while Dick Giordano stayed to oversee it. Both Wein and Giordano gave the artists all the freedom they needed and basically stayed out of their way. Later, Giordano would remark, Who copy edits Alan Moore, for God's sake? Moore began writing the series very early on, hoping to avoid publication delays such as those faced by the DC Limited series Camelot 3000. However, when writing the script for the first issue, Moore realized that he only had enough plot for six issues, while there were contracted for twelve. His solution was to alternate issues that dealt with the overall plot of the series with origin issues for the characters. As is usual for Alan Moore, his scripts for Gibbons were dense with information and detail. No detail was too small from the clothes and angles, even down to what was on someone's desks were specified, along with background details. Because of this meticulous attention to detail, the first script Gibbons received, the script for what would become the first issue of Watchmen, was around 100 pages of typescript, single-spaced, with no gaps between the individual panel descriptions or even between the pages. This meant that Gibbons had to apply his own numbers to each page in case he happened to drop the pages on the floor, which would make it near impossible to put in the proper order again. And despite Moore's detailed scripts, his panel descriptions would often end with the note, If that doesn't work for you, do what works best. Gibbons nevertheless worked to Moore's instructions most of the time. In fact, Gibbons only suggested a single change to the script, a compression of Ozymandias' narration while he was preventing a sneak attack by Rorschach, as he felt that the dialogue was too long to fit with the amount of action expressed. Moore agreed and rewrote the scene. Not every intertextual link in the series was planned by Moore either, who remarked that there were elements in there that Gibbons had put in that even he didn't notice before the sixth or seventh read, while other things turned up in there by accident. Despite his best intentions, Moore admitted in November 1986 that there were likely to be delays, stating that he was, with issue 5 on the stands, still writing issue 9. Gibbons mentioned that a major factor in the delays was the piecemeal way in which he received Moore's scripts. Gibbons said the team's pace slowed around the fourth issue. From that point onward, the two undertook their work just several pages at a time. He would get three pages of script from Moore, start drawing them, and then towards the end of those pages he would call Moore up and say, Feed me. Moore would then send another two or three pages, or maybe one page, or sometimes as many as six pages. It constantly varied. Now as the creators began to get closer to their deadlines, Moore would hire a taxi driver to drive 50 miles and deliver scripts directly to Gibbons. On later issues, Gibbons went as far as using his wife and son to draw panel grids on pages to help save time. Structurally, certain aspects of Watchmen deviated from the norm in comic books at the time, particularly the panel layout and the coloring. Instead of panels of various sizes, they divided each page into a nine-panel grid. Gibbons favored the nine-panel grid system due to its authority. Moore accepted the use of the nine-panel grid format, which gave him a level of control over the storytelling he hadn't had previously, according to Gibbons. There was this element of the pacing and visual impact that Moore could now predict and use to dramatic effect. The cover of each issue served as the first panel to the story, and the covers were designed as close-ups that focused on a single detail with no human elements present. They also experimented with the layout of the issue contents on occasion. 
An example of this is on issue 5, titled Fearful Symmetry, where the first page mirrors the last, with the following pages mirroring each other before the center spread is symmetrical in layout. It wasn't until halfway through the series that they realized that Rorschach would not survive the book. They realized that the character had a king-sized death wish and would put himself in such a position where the wish would ultimately be met. He was in psychological pain every moment of his existence, and he wanted out of it, but with honor, whatever his definition of honor was. Near the end of the project, Moore realized that the story bore some similarity to The Architects of Fear, an episode of the Outer Limits television series which led Moore and editor Lynn Wein to argue over the ending. Wein kept telling Moore to be more original, telling him that he had the capability to do something different and not do something that had already been done. But when Moore refused to give in, Wein quit the project. Moore would go on, however, to acknowledge the Outer Limits episode by referencing it in the series' last issue. Quote, The most important was the actual storytelling. Where the world that was presented didn't really hang together in terms of linear cause and effect, but was instead seen as some massively complex, simultaneous effect with connections made of coincidence, synchronicity, and I think it was this worldview, if anything, that resonated with an audience that had realized that their previous view of the world was not adequate for the complexities of this scary and shadowy new world that we were entering. End quote. Watchmen was published in single-issue form over the course of 1986 and 1987. The limited series was a commercial success, and its sales helped DC Comics briefly overtake its competitor Marvel Comics and the comic book direct market. The series' publishing schedule ran into delays because it was scheduled with three issues completed instead of the six editor Lynn Wayne believed were necessary. Further delays were caused when later issues each took more than a month to complete. One contemporaneous report noted that although DC solicited issue number 12 for publication in April 1987, it soon became apparent it wouldn't debut until July or August. After the series concluded, the individual issues were collected and sold in trade paperback form. Along with Frank Miller's 1986 Batman, The Dark Knight Returns miniseries, Watchmen was marketed as a graphic novel, a term that allowed DC and other publishers to sell similar comic book collections in a way that associated them with novels and disassociated them from comics. As a result of the publicity given to books like The Watchmen, Bookstores, trade paperback in 1987, and public libraries began to devote special shelves to them. Watchmen received critical praise, both inside and outside of the comics industry. Time magazine named it as one of the 100 greatest novels, not comics, but books in general, which says a lot about the impact Watchmen had, as it's the only comic to be included on the list. In 1988, Watchmen received a Hugo Award in the Other Forms category. According to Gibbons, Moore had his award placed upside down in his garden and used it as a bird table. Undoubtedly, Watchmen altered the way Americans look at comics as a medium. By using recurring visual motifs to its impressive display elasticity of the nine-panel grid to the idea that every piece of the comic should be a storytelling device, it was a groundbreaking effort. And finally, as we always do, I will leave you with one final quote from the author. I've developed a theory that there is an inverse relationship between money and imagination, that if you've got lots of imagination, then you don't really need much money, and if you've got lots of money, then you won't bother with much imagination. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemore Hardin, 
We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash house of words. Until next time, keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason Nimore Harden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason Nimore Harden. <laughs>